put off by how long this video is, don't worry. I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast. So while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. If the video is simply too long for you, I did record a shorter version and the link is in the description box. X-Men Days of Future Past 3D Mood Review. As we saw in the post credit scenes of the Wolverine, Xavier and Magneto approach Wolverine because they need his help. He is the fan favorite and I guess they figured that even Singer's return to the franchise wasn't enough to ensure that enough people would watch it. Seriously, Wolverine almost doesn't even really need to be here. This movie is about Magneto, Xavier, and Mystique and their relationships with each other. And But I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, they ask him to travel back to the past to stop an assassination. It's basically Terminator if the assassin was already in the past. Now the assassin is Mystique and the assassination itself will trigger the the Sentinel program which basically a Sentinel is a huge humanoid robot that is really good at killing things and it's after mutants something bad so yeah given that the future is a post-apocalyptic mess and yeah that's what Wolverine is going back to stop now he does have his work cut out for him because he's gonna have to talk Beast, Xavier and Magneto into somehow stopping Mystique, and it doesn't help that Magneto is in jail for the whole magic bullet thing. And yeah, at, uh, on its face, this seems like it has way too much plot for a 130-minute movie. Really, it uses it well. I, I did not feel like there was any plot here that was rushed through, which I'm really glad because I feel like we've had enough of that in this franchise by now. And yeah, it just it moves along very fast and actually yeah, just every scene feels big and necessary. Now, as Mr. Repsion pointed out, this is more of a drama than an action film. And it's it really works out for us. One of my big problems with The Wolverine, which I still maintain is a great film, is that it can't really decide which of the two it wants to be, a Hollywood blockbuster or a drama. And this conflict is really, really harms the overall film. This film, however, very much chooses to be first and foremost a character-driven drama. And any action scenes that come along the way are entirely organic from these people and the, the powers that they have. Now, as I said, it's very much the a movie about the the relationship between Magneto, Xavier, and Mystique, and their their relationships with one another, even independent of the the third person being in. I mean, Mystique is sort of a, a little bit of a chess piece 
between the the two. They both want to. It's it's she's she's symbolic of a a victory for either of them. Which which of their approaches is better, and that comes into play some here, and is also somewhat you know called out. I mean that is somewhat what excuse me what first class did, and first class did a lot of things that were not entirely brilliant, and this one. This one goes in and somehow manages to fix it all without actually feeling like is just rushing around fixing things. But I am really amazed by how well this movie came out. I, I mean, I, I, I feel like I should still be mad at Singer for having left the the franchise in in the mess that it fell into when he left, but this is a glory, you know, the prodigal son returns, and just, and and there was much rejoicing. Yeah, it fixes everything that first class messed up, and just in general, it, yeah, it, it fixes so, so many things that were meh about the franchise, or downright bad about the franchise. So yes, Mystique in part this kind of chess piece between the two, and at the same time she's also very much her own person. And yes, there is sort of the the struggle of those two within her, but at the same time she is she is her own independent. She was her own she's her own person independent of the two of them. And the you know you obviously have the beloved camaraderie, sort of, you know, friends in spite of being on, you know, opposite sides. They, different tactics to the same overall problem, you might say, of Xavier and Magneto. And I think it was the, the what the flip guys who, one of them, possibly Ben, who compared it to, you know, Magneto's Malcolm X and Xavier as MLK, and yeah, that is very present here. I, th I think that's at the core of the, of, of these movies in general. When, when these movies are at their best, they are contrasting the, the two with each other and having having them debate over these things and here we really get that with the two younger with with Fassbender and McAvoy and yeah I probably pronounced James's last name wrong anyway and it's fantastic it really just Yeah, it it works exactly the way it should. I mean, when when I wa when when you watch First Class, clearly these are talented people in front of the, you know, in front of the camera. And from what I understand, the people behind the camera. But that movie is somewhat of a mess from having to reconcile continuity and trying to rush through things. Clearly, they were very talented people, and they were well cast in these roles. And now they actually get some material that really plays to that. And Mystique really, I mean, it's not really a surprise that Jennifer Lawrence can really pull off this really intense and determined and, you know, willing to kill kind of thing. But in this, I mean, not only does she get to play to that, you know, among her strengths, but in general, this really shows her range. I mean, you have that kind of intensity. You have her more hopeful. You have her just devastated. Just, 
yeah, she she plays so many different, you know, so many different emotional states in this, and she does it flawlessly. I I just she is she is so perfectly cast as Mystique, and I'm really glad that the yeah I'm really glad she's getting another chance. I, I really wasn't a fan of of First Class and of the Mystique in in First Class, and this is much much better. But yes, I think that pretty well covers the overall. So so yeah. The, those are the three main characters, you might say. And this is very much, where First Class was very much Magneto's movie, this is very much Xavier's movie. And it is, you know, when, when we first meet him, he is just devastated at, basically, he's kind of given up. It, you know, things haven't gone so well you know, I, I mean, Beast is there helping him, trying to reassure him. First class and was first class wasn't that bad, but nope, he just will not hear it. And Wolverine now has to convince him to, you know, come back. And I don't want to give away too much about Xavier, but I will say they did some brilliant things there with the right. Again, I. Some things that were left a certain way in first class are used really well here. I think you'll know what I mean when you watch the film, and you should watch the film. End of sentence. And they they just do it so well, and he plays it so well. I before I watched these movies, I was not really before watching first class. I wasn't really wild about James McAvoy. I think it's especially because we wanted. But just in general, that movie, yeah, never mind. And here he just he does brilliant. I mean there's there's the scene of him and Stuart playing the two different Xaviers face to face and it is just fantastic. You really, yeah, it's, I say everything that really works here is almost everything that really works in this movie is born out of the drama in these, these characters. And yeah, I think this is a good time to bring up Wolverine is present and he does I mean there are things that he does that kind of need to be him doing those things but overall he, he really didn't need to, it did not need to be Wolverine if it wasn't if he wasn't the fan favorite I don't think he would be the time traveler in this movie he might still be there but I, I don't know exactly how it you know I don't know, maybe maybe if it was Beast being sent back, but but anyway, Wolverine is present. Beast does sometimes enter into it because he does very much have a relationship with Mystique, and that is that does also come come into play somewhat. But it is primarily the the Trinity that I've already mentioned, and but but certainly Beast. There's a good reason he's there, and that's kind of that's something this movie does that is brilliant, and that I would argue that this is the best of the X-Men movies, which you know, I mean, there are three good X-Men movies: the first, the second, and then this one, and. And the Wolverine is also good, but it's not completely an X-Men movie. This one might be the best, and in part it is because this goes in and says, let's focus on just a few characters. Like I mentioned, it's the Trinity, then Beast is somewhat in there as well, and then Logan is present, and that's about it. Those are the, the characters of this movie. And 
that that makes it more focused and makes sure that every character has something compelling to do. Like, there is... Excuse me. As, as a sort of... I've already mentioned Mystique is the assassin. They spend some time trying to get to her, and we, we the audience, are also seeing what she's doing and where she is and the like. And the movie really does well with these different characters in different situations moving towards the overall... I mean, they know that the other is there also doing something, and... It, it goes to, it, it contrasts these characters against each other and just... When, when the characters are all working together, it kind of forces them, like they are in the other movies, it kind of forces out individuality, especially when there are a lot of characters. And so it's, you know, with this one, we get that individuality back, and yeah, I mean the the whole the the core of why this works is because they are such strong characters. You there's there's so much there, and I mean you almost wouldn't think. I mean we've we've had these three characters for three movies, shut up, there's only these three, and yeah, you wouldn't think that after those first two that there would be that much interesting left, but there is, and again, this this one really does pick up where First Class left, left off, and it actually follows up on, you know, what, how do these people feel after the experiences they had in First Class? How, how, is, how is the reunion going to feel? to everyone, and, you know, what will the party favors be, so on and so forth. And, yeah, the, the movie is, is really focused. It's, it's laser beam-like focused on just this core conflict. And part of, you know, you, you have these three characters with different ideas for what, what should what should be done, how do we best solve the problems and such, and at the same time we have the core problem of the Sentinels, you know, will the, you know, it, it, they, they do genuinely have to figure out what, yeah, how, how, do, you, how do you solve that, how do you, and, and they have different ideas for that, and that's that's really where it comes from. It is very much, yeah, and uh, now the, you know, Magneto does don some of his familiar costume in this, although he does not quite go as magenta as, as in first class, and this one does... I suppose the, the time travel aspect is, is good to get into. Now, the, the basically, the film starts with us being, you know, Logan and us being sent back to the 70s, which are not... They're they're well done, and it doesn't feel the need to constantly, you know, remind us that it's you know it's the seventies. And this is also, I mean, they they the Nixon is quite good. I mean, you, you know, this is not the I am not a crook, you know, OTT Nixon that we've seen in in a lot of these movies with with. Fake Nixon's. This is very much. I mean, this. Yeah, this just feels like a real person that happens to be Richard Nixon, you know. And yeah, so so yeah, we you know sent back 
from the future to the past. Now, the future itself, we don't see an awful lot of after, I mean, as we can see from the, the introduction, you know, Tron Legacy has had had somewhat of an impact. So so that's good. But we don't see that much of the we don't spend a lot of time in the future timeline to time period. And to a certain extent, it almost feels like that didn't really need to be there. Now, I'm not saying that like the That, that we shouldn't see the, the future time period at all. I do think that the, the movie doesn't gain a lot from showing us the, the future again after that initial scene, although it does gain some, and I wouldn't want to lose that. But I do also think that some of the, the future stuff is some of the weaker stuff, and I do want to make absolutely clear, it's it's well produced. You know, it looks great and it's it's fun to watch, but it is also where the, I mean, I've already mentioned that this focuses on fairly few characters. You've probably seen the list of like, you know. Yeah, there are a bunch of mutants in this one, and they are mostly in the, the future period. And that is also, you know, you see some of the trailers of these, yeah, future people fighting. That is also where that, yeah. And, yeah, it's fun. I'm not going to complain. I, I can't complain about the action. And, you know, it is fun to see Bishop and I think Warpath. I'm pretty sure I knew him as, as under another name, but, but yeah. And Sun, Sunspot, I think. Oh, it's been too long since I read the comics. But, but, yeah, it's a ton of fun to see, you know, them, them up on the screen and doing their thing blink. But they really are just cool tricks, you know, they, they, I mean, they might as well just be faceless, well, they are faceless, they, they, they say nothing and they do nothing, everything that, you know, the, the only thing that they're there for is to, to fight and they do that, and that's it, and you could have cut that, you could have cut the, the future action scenes without really losing anything. And it's also, I mean, it's fun enough, but it does feel, I'm not sure filler is the right, fan service. It feels fan service-y. And yes, I, I am a fan and I was serviced, but I would still, it, it's more interesting once the once we get to the, the actual trinity and that exploration it gets going and it's also it, it really doesn't help that this pulls one of those fake out action scenes where the the typical thing is that oh it was just a training program or it was a dream sequence something like that happens in this thankfully it's early so then we get it out of the way but yeah, that is where we get some of the... In fact, when it first happens... Yeah, it's just... Trust me, it happens really early. I'm not spoiling anything. It is how we first see the whole time travel thing. And when you first see it, I personally at least found it confusing and wish that they had just... That it, it was more... Yeah, that, that it was it was to explain better or shown in a more clear way something, but 
Yeah, it's, it's maybe especially because, I mean, yeah, okay, so it's, it's a time jump. They jump back in time. That in itself is fine, but they've attached an entire action scene to it, and you don't realize until the action scene is over that there were no stakes in that action scene. And, yeah, and that's, that's kind of a double whammy there. So, so yeah. And once we do get past that, it, it gets really good. But, yeah, it does also establish that we do need, you know, there, there is some tension from the, the future. If basically you have the two, you know, two different time periods. You have the future and you have the, the past. And if something, you know, let's say that from when Logan arrives in the past, from when he is sent in the future, there are, let's say, a week from, you know, down to the hour. When that time is passed in the future, that time is passed in the past. I should have picked a different phrasing there. So when that, when that time is up, you know, if... If something were to happen in the future that affects Logan as he's lying there, because basically it's that his mind has been transferred from the, you know, from the older to the younger. And that is a, you know, yeah, that, that sets up that if something happens to his body in the future, then, you know, Things will be messed up in the past, and that's something that they really do get some good stuff out of. But for the most part, the the whole thing with yeah the the future thing doesn't really come into play much, and isn't really it's it's kind of just where we get some action scenes that have nothing to do with the the people that we're actually following and it's kind of a it's a way to make the action more diverse and more colorful than it would otherwise be and yeah it, it just it feels a little cheap again I'm not saying it wasn't fun but and it's maybe especially because the action that we do get is Fantastic! From the, I mean, again, it's it's more of a drama than an action film, but this uses the powers really well. Like, first class does not does not use Mystique well. She almost did not need to be a shapeshifter in that movie. It, you know, her character makes sense for that movie, but the fact that she's a shapeshifter doesn't really enter in, enter into the action, which would be fine, except it's an action movie. It's not. You know, if it was just a straight up drama, but here it actually, they actually use it well. See, when Singer does it, they know how to use the, the shape shifting ability properly. You know, him and Cameron, they're, they're like the two directors who know how to use characters who change their appearance to, to blend in well. So, anyway. They, they, yeah, they use the, the powers of these various characters really well, and it's, it's always an issue with these X-Men movies that you have so many so powerful characters so, you know, so close together, and what X-Men 1 and 2 do, do is kind of write out a lot of these, you know, write out of commission some of these characters, split them up and such. And in this one, because there are so few, you know, once once one is in a different room from the others, or, you know, it, it doesn't take a huge amount in this one to, to split them off a little bit. And in this one, it doesn't feel so forced. And, yeah, it works really well. You never feel... I mean, it's awkward the way that they're written apart in the first one. Perhaps some of this as well. 
But if you know if you don't have the the awkward writing part, then you're just stuck with, well, why the heck isn't that character just doing this? Which you know you have in the last stand and you know origins. If we're gonna acknowledge the existence of that movie and first class. Now the we don't get a we don't spend a lot of time in, in the future timeline, but it is made clear the Sentinels will put mutants in internment camps or and or kill them. And yeah, it's it's very clearly a sort of it's it's kind of it's the overreaction to the to to the problem of the the mutant problem, what mutant problem, and yeah, it's it's quite well done. You you I mean, I I rewatch the the anime series, which you know, the the two parter episode holds up really well. I'd forgotten how how fun that show was, how well done that show was in general. And reread the the comics for the storyline, so I knew going in that this was you know, yeah. Before I sat down in the theater, I knew that this was a big important story. That this whole, yeah, that that, that there were stakes, and this movie does really well to establish that, and quite early on too. Now, the this is more I I do have to get into Quicksilver. He does not have that much of a connection to the other characters. I mean, there there is a little wink and a nod. Is he maybe related to? But other than that, he's really not terribly related to the other characters in this, and he's not in it for a whole lot, and he probably could have been written out, but man, is he fun, and he is... He is the best element that isn't directly related to the, the Trinity and everything around that. He, he, is, he is so much fun. I have to say, the trailers do not do him justice. In general, I wasn't really sold on any of the trailers. The movie is far better than the trailers make it, make it look. Trust me. If everything that I, I saw in the trailers, and I was like, eh, looks a little worked out really well. And everything that was like... I guess it could be good, really good. So so anyway, Quicksilver, basically, yeah, a mutant that can run extremely fast, and like he is, you know, he he gets really bored really quickly. He's he's like he's like ADHD mutant, you know, with. I mean, when you when you first see him, he's like playing ping pong with himself, and then he rushes over to play pong with himself, you know, really quickly. You, you just see the score go up really quickly, and like he talks fast, you know. At at one point, you see him in an elevator, and he's just like standing, come on, come on, can we move on? It's like, yeah, it's a lot of fun, and I mean, he basically there is one thing that he can really do in the action scenes, move really fast, but they use it so well. I, I'm not going to give anything away, but I will say that there is a glorious, infinitely rewatchable sequence in this that uses him... Yeah, I'm going to give just a few details. I'm not going to spoil anything, but... Basically, he's moving around an area, 
and he's adjusting things as he goes along. And I mean, there there is some, yeah. And and he just he has fun with it. And the whole bit is is I mean, it lasts maybe a minute or two, and the whole thing is scored, you know, set to this, you know, pop song, really upbeat and. It's, just, it's a ton of fun, and that scene alone is worth watching the movie for. It is so much fun, and yeah, they use him. They use him so well. I, uh, <laughs> I, I can forgive Singer for that one. That you know, addition which didn't need to be there, but I'm, I'm quite glad that. It was, uh, yeah. Now the excuse me. Now the excuse me. Yes, the the powers of the. I mean, Xavier's telepathy. Mystique's shape-shifting and Magneto's control of, of metals used really, really well in, in the movie. I mean, there are so many things in this. And this movie really shows that if you know what you're doing, you can make something that... Something like this work, you know. I mean, basically, if if you, yeah, if if we focus on the Trinity as the movie does, basically, you you just have these three people, the three powers I just mentioned, and yeah, how do the, how do they affect each other? How do they, you know, how how would they fight each other, and what would they do under this, you know? Under these or those circumstances, all this kind of stuff, and yeah, it's just th th we get some amazing action out of that, and really great tense scenes as well. Now, the there there are a ton of little references to the movies. I, I think this references all of the X-Men movies. And certainly, I'm almost certain it shows clips from all of them at, at one point or another. And, yeah, there are uh, some very nice little things that if you don't know the movie, if, if, if you've forgotten, or if you haven't watched the movie that is being referenced, that's fine. It's not... Uh, you know, it's it's a little detail, like something I really hope that they would do. They actually did. There's a cameo in First Class, which is followed up, up on here. Yes, that one. Yes, it is awesome. And yeah, there are just a ton of little like. <laughs> there's a bit where like Wolverine kind of. Yeah, he, he's a little aggressive towards Magneto. And he's got the he's got just the bone claws. And Magneto just says, Imagine if those were metal. And it's just it's stuff like that, you know. It, yeah, just a little I mean, if someone watches that movie who hasn't seen the first movie that that isn't going to be like they're they're not going to get the same thing out of it but it's not a major you know you can still follow what's going on without having seen the other movies that's actually something i'd say you could basically follow this movie if it, if you haven't watched a single movie in the rest of the the series i'm not sure that this is really if if you aren't at all interested already, I don't think this would really be something that would... I think this one is a little too complex to 
win over those who aren't already. I mean, let's say if you aren't sold on superheroes, time travel, you know, giant robots, if at least one of those hasn't already, you know, put your ass in the seat, then this probably shouldn't be the first of the movies you watch. If, yeah. But yeah, you can you can follow it without really knowing anything else, and you'll still appreciate. It. I mean, they don't really every everything that you need to understand in order to follow it is either explicitly stated or sufficiently. It you know it can be inferred from what is being said. You know you. You won't be in the dark if you if you don't know the, the continuity. Now the something that could have been a problem with this if is if the, the time travel and timelines got confusing and like I say we don't spend a lot of time in in the future portion but it, it isn't really ever confusing and certainly once the yeah it it it, it does it quite well this gives some good closure to the, the original X-Men cast and there are some golden cameos that, yeah. Now, Mystique is so, sort of this movie's Catwoman that is the, the Dark Knight Rises Catwoman, not the Catwoman Catwoman in that she's kind of a, you know, you don't really know who she's going to side with, what she's going to do, and she's she's quick and she's smart. So, yeah, and and she's important, she's dangerous. So, and, and they use her really well. So, yeah. I am so glad that Brian Singer came back to this this franchise. Now, the there, there are some fantastic set pieces in this movie. You, you see s some little hints in the in the trailers with uh, Magneto lifting a, a stadium and yeah, there, there are <laughs> They're amazing. There, there isn't one of those that is wasted or that is kind of that that isn't as good as you would hope it to be. They're all fantastic. Now the the movie does su suffer some from the lack of a one specific villain the way you know the others do, and I suppose what to an extent, what comes the closest here is the, the the inventor of the Sentinels, Bolivar Trask, and he is a he's he's a bit manipulative and very very determined, and he does, you know, I mean. He seems to be well-intentioned. I would think that his heart is in the right place, but we'll find out after the autopsy. Basically, the way he sees it is that humanity can come together in hating mutants. No, in... in protecting each other and themselves from mutants. Not necessarily saying that they're, you know, that they're dangerous, just 
yes, something like that. He he rationalizes it, you know, and yeah, I mean, you you do get the idea that he isn't really trying to just be be awful. It's you know, some people don't have to apply themselves too much to be awful. Now the. The, the, this has been said to be the biggest and the best since X-Men 2. Yeah, definitely. And, and like I already said, I would say this is the best of, of the X-Men movies. It, it's, it's very Blade. It's ha it has all of the strengths and none of the weaknesses. I mean, yeah, as I've already mentioned, this... Now, the... the Bolivar Trask is portrayed by Peter Dinklage, who is, you know, best known from his role in Prince of Persia, The Two Thrones. Game of Thrones, sorry. I, yeah, I, I got them mixed up. You know, the, yeah, the, the one that is, you know, a great presentation of a story and an action in a medium, which I'm familiar with. As you go in there, I haven't seen Game of Thrones, but from what I understand, it makes sense that he was cast for this, and yeah, I can I can understand why people love him on Game of Thrones, because he is great here. Very, yeah, like I said, manipulative, smart, and, you know, trying to prove himself there. It, it becomes kind of a theme that he is sort of trying to get attention. She, you know, people, people are saying that, uh, does it really, is what he's asking for really, you know, necessary? Does it really make sense? And he, he's insistent, excuse me, without, excuse me, whilst retaining his dignity. And... Yeah, there, there is kind of this thing, you know, he, he has something to prove, kind of thing. Now, the, the climax of this one is amazing. Like, it is this, I don't want to give anything away, but it is a big action scene. It is tense. And it's, it's all about the main characters and a, a yeah, the drama. And I've, all of those things are ingredients of a great climax. So <laughs> I am so glad Brian Singer has come back to, to these. Yeah, so... <laughs> This does go for more of a where the the first couple of X Men movies very much try to root themselves in, you know, this very much realistic kind of thing. This one does go a bit bigger, especially in these you know future action scenes and such. And yeah, it's it's fun. And what I also really say is, in this one, every every mutant really gets a a good introduction that that really shows what their power is, how their power works. So we don't, you know, there's no having to explain these powers. We just literally visually see their powers in action and from that yeah we, we realize how yeah and uh, seeing blink in action I demand that there there be a you know portal 3 that is how you're how, how you do it you know the just just add some you know giant humanoid robots and that, yeah 
Now, the... I think that might more or less cover it. This, this is one of the best comic book movies I've seen in a long time. One of the best movies I've seen in a long time. It's definitely, it's right up there with Captain America 2. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic movie. And I would recommend it to anyone who is even somewhat interested in, again, you don't have to be, you don't have to know a ton about the, you know, the continuity and such. But yeah, you you can still enjoy it a lot from, yeah. It's also it it has a great sense of humor. Like there are, yeah, there there are a number of, you know. Encounters and you know the, the moment you have this sort of time travel thing, of course, there is this thing of you're not gonna believe this, but I'm from the future, and yeah, you you would think that jokes like that have been done to death. This one still finds a way to be funny about that. So yeah, now. This Quicksilver Avengers, you have you have something to live up to there. I'm not saying you can't do it because you've done great things so far, but you do have something to live up to here. I I I I expect you to produce as as compelling a Quicksilver as as this. Now the It is slightly odd that with let's say the the whether or not there are adamantium claws in this yeah that didn't slightly unexpected let's let's go with that the the yeah those who are supposed to know what I mean, know what I mean. Now... The, the Quicksilver scenes were apparently shot at like 3,600 3, frames per minute, making him move 1,500 times faster. That was a great idea. It, it really... Yeah, it's, it's a unique visual to to see him do that and then add that with the really really fun material so yeah now I suppose that might more or less It, it is a. I've already mentioned that you know it's it's more of a drama. It is a. It it can be a somewhat heavy film. It's there, there's a lot of pain and anger. I, I don't remember exactly who said it. I think it was one of the interviews. That is very much the case. It is a movie that really gets to you emotionally and. Yeah. I mean, this when when a drama director gets passionate about you know comic books, yeah, this this is what you get. And man, am I glad we got Brian Singer back. I think that pretty well covers it. And I have reached my quota of saying just how happy I am that, that Brian Singer is back. So, yeah. Watch this movie if, if at all you 
have any kind of interest in any of the the elements here. Yeah, I mean, it flies right by. You don't. It doesn't feel like, you know, it's more of drama than an action movie. But you're never bored. There is no point where you're just waiting for something to happen. Or, I mean, there might not be stuff blowing up all the time, but there is always something interesting going on with the characters, and the scenes are always compelling. So, yeah. So yeah, I. I guess in closing, performances are great. The cast remains great. Just the the. Everything about the writing is really solid. It's. Yeah, I mean it. It has you right from the start, and right up until the end. And do stay through the credits because. Singer, you're awesome, and I just exceeded my quota. I've reviewed other parts of this series. The links are in the description box. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.